My name is Kathleen Kimball uh, Melanakis, and this is her book. Uh, the book is Secret Combinations, uh, Evidence of Early Mormon Counterfeiting, 1800 to 1847. But this is a really cool book. Um, the premise of this book, or one of the main foci of this book, is to talk about you know, Kathleen's deep investigation into the extent to which she feels you know, the counterfeiting of currency um, was intertwined with the, the founding of, of Mormonism with Joseph Smith, with his family, and with the early leaders of the Mormon church. Did I hear that correctly? Kathleen Kimball Melanakos' deep investigation has revealed that Joseph Smith and his family were counterfeiters? Well, I guess if you consider currency drawn on the Bank of Michigan owned by Stephen Mack, Lucy Mack's brother, to be counterfeit, then she might have a point. However, the Bank of Michigan was a duly authorized legal banking institution, and the Mack family directed it for approximately eight years. Stephen Mack, Lucy Mack's brother, was the founder and the bonds holder for the Bank of Michigan. As a wealthy industrialist, Stephen Mack was pivotal in apparently financing the Kirkland Temple after Lucy Mack made a personal visit to her brother in Detroit, as she revealed in her autobiography that she was responsible for obtaining the loans to finance the Kirkland Temple. After all the elders, including Elder Cahoon, failed to procure any financing. So contrary to what the Utah Mormon Church wants you to believe, the Smith and Mack families were wealthy Eastern aristocrats, pivotal in the Revolutionary War of 1812, the Civil War, in protecting and fighting on the side of the Union. Contrary to the Quorum of the Twelve, who swore blood oaths to destroy the United States. Oh, and by the way, significant Lucy Mack never refers to the Kirtland Temple as a temple. She refers to it as the House of the Lord, a meeting place, and a school. Also, Joseph Smith went out east and brought back the architectural renderings for the temple itself indicating that the Eastern banking establishments wanted to approve the architectural design of the temple or they finance the temple. So I found this book outlining all the financial connections of the Mack family. Funny how other Mormon insiders just fail to note all the contrary information, which goes against or is contrary to the conventional story that Joseph Smith was born of humble origins. His family stumbled from one financial disaster to another. Quite the contrary, both the Smith and Mack families were indeed very wealthy. And in fact, Stephen Mack, Lucy's brother, was one of the wealthiest men in Michigan and was married to a full-blooded Winnebago Indian Honanaga, who today there are three high schools named after Honanaga, who is so influential and loved by the people of Michigan. So let's begin to read from this very interesting book that outlines all the financial connection of the Mack family. Solomon Mack started out in a comfortable home in Lyme, London County, Connecticut. His parents owned a large property and lived in style. However, the family ran into some financial difficulties, and Solomon Mack had to hire himself out to a neighboring farmer until 21 years of age. Fighting in the French and Indian Wars around Lake George and Lake Champlain, where he acquitted himself with bravery, his fortunes waxed and waned as a merchant, land developer, shipmaster, mill operator, and farmer. But Solomon Mack made a tidy sum during his army service. He invested that money in 1,600 acres of wilderness in the Granville, New York, an attempt to make money at sea transporting goods from New England to New York was dashed on the rocks of Long Island. After farming in Lyme, Connecticut, and Marlow, southern New Hampshire, Solomon joined his brother Alicia Mack at Gilson. 
New York, where the two operated a saw and grist mill. During the Revolutionary War, Solomon Mech helped round up saltpeter for gunpowder and operated a baggage carriage, as well as enlisting with the artillery. Together with his sons, Jason and Stephen, Solomon Mack privateered under Captain Havens on the sloop Beaver. With the end of hostilities, the sons and the father joined the merchant marine, taking a ship plus cargo to Liverpool, Nova Scotia, and selling both. For four years, they undertook fishing voyages off Nova Scotia. After the return journey with Captain Foster, they bought the ship from him. They took the passengers to Connecticut and then ran into a reef near Halifax with a boat loaded with dry goods. Solomon Mack sold the wreck and worked his way up to another ship of 40 tons, but was forced to abandon the sea for reasons of health. The family worked hard to earn enough to move to Turnbridge. In the 1790s, we find Solomon working with his brother Alicia and Samuel on dams and mill projects on on the Connecticut River. Samuel was hired by the English company to build a dam there, and Solomon with his son Solomon Jr. assisted him. Alicia participated in the toll bridge in 1792 and in the canal, lock and dam construction projects. In 1793, Stephen Mack moved his family from Gilsom to Turnbridge, Vermont, bringing along his sister Lucy to help them with his children. Here she met and married Joseph Smith Sr. in 1796. In 1810 in Windsor, Solomon, now deeply interested in religion, published his autobiographical sketches in a pamphlet form. Solomon and his wife Lydia resided in Sharon with their son Daniel Jr. until the wife's death in 1818. In the winter of 1816, the Joseph Smith Sr. family left for Palmyra. At that point, though unbeknownst to him, Solomon had completed all of his economic achievements. After Lydia's death, Solomon moved back to Gilsom, New Hampshire, to live out his days with his son Solomon Jr., dying in 1820. Stephen Mack Like her older brother Jason Mack, Lucy's second oldest brother was socially and economically impressive man to his younger sister. Colonel Stephen Mack impact in the territory of Michigan was such that he is mentioned in the local histories, as well as in the legal documents from the time, mainly relating to the Bank of Michigan and other business ventures. Thus, there is a number of sources that need to be reconciled as they are in variance with each other. Stephen Mack, after privateering with his father and brother Jason during the Revolutionary War, set himself up in 1787 as a merchant in Gilsom, New Hampshire, where one half of the Solomon Mack family was residing. In addition, Stephen set up a store and a large hotel or tavern located along the scenic sidearm of the White River known as the Branch in Turnbridge, Vermont, where the other half of the Solomon Mack family lived. Stephen cultivated an extensive farm. In 1793, he moved to Turnbridge and, bought his sister, and brought his sister Lucy with him to take care of his children. Stephen Mack opened a tanning business in the Turnbridge, possibly with John, possibly with John Mudgett as a partner. When Lucy married Joseph Smith Sr. in 1796, Stephen and his business partner, John Mudgett, gave her $500 each as a wedding present. During the 1800s, Stephen Mack became a colonel in the Green Mountain Regiments in Vermont and began to reorient himself commercially. Sometime after 1807, but definitely by 1810, Stephen Mack began to operate wholesale and retail establishments in Detroit. As a former colonel in the Vermont militia, he served under General Hull in the defense of Detroit. The officers of the occupying British forces used his beautiful house as quarters and confiscated his merchandise. An employee assisted in the hiding of the money. Now that employee happened to be his wife, Honanega, but we're just going to call her an employee. Sometime during the Detroit stay, Stephen Mack owned a boat on the Lake 
Erie. Years later, when the young Mormon church moved from New York to Kirtland, Ohio, Lucy Mack Smith would meet Stephen's former employee, Captain Blake, who had since Stephen's death taken over the boat. And Lucy Mack refers to this Captain Blake in her autobiography, saying how um, he had purchased the boat from her brother, Stephen Mack. In 1818, Stephen Mack was one of the founding members in the establishment of the Bank of Michigan, a very wealthy man indeed, where he served as director until at least 1825. James McCloskey became a cashier of the bank, and Stephen Mack was one of the bondsmen on the bond of $20,000 against the obligations for the Bank of Michigan. During the winter of 1818 and 1819, the company of Mac Honet Sibley built the first dam in Pontiac and there the first sawmill. Between 1810 and 1820, Stephen Mack had visited his family only sporadically in Turnbridge, Vermont. Then in 1820, Stephen brought his family from Turnbridge to Detroit and thence to Pontiac, Michigan, where he set up a business and bought two farms. Stephen Mack's business continued to grow, and by November of 1820, he was operating multiple stores in Michigan and Ohio, the largest of which was employed six clerks. Stephen Mack also built a grist and sawmill in Rochester, Michigan. Equally, he built, equally, he built a distillery in 1823 and 1824, a woolen mill that did carding, spinning, and weaving. That same year, Stephen Mack represented the Oakland County in the Territory Council. Stephen Mack died in 1826. His estate was first embroiled and then consumed by the defalcation of the Bank of Michigan, for whose cashier Stephen Mack had been a bondsman. When justice, had, when justice had run its course in December of 1828, the $30,000 worth of damages was collected from Stephen Mack's estate, leaving the, es, the estate destitute and not with a legacy of 50000 clear of encumbrances, as Lucy Mack reports. Lucy most likely saw Stephen last in 1807 when he departed for Detroit and the Smiths moved back to Turnbridge. The Smiths and Stephen Mack's wife and the children may have crossed paths and exchanged information in Norwich in 1860, where Stephen's son, Alman, visited the military academy. Now that whole paragraph is incorrect in Lucy Mack Smith's autobiography. She states that she visited her, her brother while he was living in Detroit. She visited him from Kirkland, and she went to Detroit to visit Stephen Mack. Also, Stephen Mack's son, Stephen Mack Jr., attended Moore's Indian Charity School at Dartmouth with Hiram Smith cousins. So the families remain very close. Not as this paragraph indicates that they didn't see each other after 1807. Further, this also indicates being a main uh, trader in Michigan, owning a bank, owning several mercantile businesses, uh, on and on it goes. The Mack family could be defined as industrialists of their time, are owning multiple businesses that were influential in the settling and the occupation of the new Western Territory of Michigan and Detroit. This family, indeed, the Mack families were very influential and very prominent, not as we are led to believe that they come from humble circumstances. Neither did Joseph Smith Sr. come from humble circumstances. His father, Azazel, was very influential, and his great uncle was the Dartmouth College scholar who introduced the ancient language curriculum into the United States. Therefore, Lucy Mack Smith and Joseph Smith Jr., learned at the fount of the expert in ancient languages and had indeed bragging rights to more knowledge or superior knowledge of ancient languages than most people in the United States at the time. Origins of the Mormon Church is indeed more interesting, more complex than what the Utah Mormon scholars 
want you to believe. We should be proud that we as a people were instrumental in pushing forward the Western expansion of the United States and the final expulsion of the British from the North American continent. If you're not proud of that, I don't know what else you should be proud of because we're still fighting the British today in the Christopher Steele PP dossier. That is hilarious, if somewhat sad.